Turn to your Bible, Exodus chapter 10. Um, we are continuing in a journey. And can I say, you are all a sight for sore eyes. Y'all look beautiful today. And I thank you so much for your prayers last week. I woke up at um, fever, headache, uh, body aches, and doing things I won't describe because some of y'all are squeamish. Um, probably shouldn't say I'm in church anyway, I guess. But um, I thank you for your prayers last week. And I, I think it's, it's a tremendous thing that we... Our, our, church, our church is in a place where the pastor can be gone and like it not skip a beat. We can worship. Such a tremendous thing. Um, and so, I'm, you know, after some antibiotics and steroids and all that stuff, I feel great. <laughs> um, but it is such an amazing church to be a part of where that can happen. I think that's a sign of a, very, of a healthy church. And, and so I appreciate um, David did a wonderful message last Sunday. He was able to give last minute. Um, and thank you for your prayers, um, I, you know, for, for that. But so open your Bibles, Exodus chapter 10. And if you haven't already done so, we're continuing on in this journey look at the, looking at the book of Exodus and what God is doing um, through the book of Exodus, through this, through this historical account of God taking his people, his chosen people out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, giving them a land of their own. And so far, we've seen how God has taken this guy Moses, he's raised him up for this purpose to confront Pharaoh in order to make his name great and all of that. And today there's going to be a couple more plagues we're going to read about in the book of, in, in chapter 10. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but I want to strongly encourage you this week to read the whole chapter. We don't do that for the sake of time. But two plagues in particular that are embedded into this chapter are the plagues of locusts and the plagues of, and the plague of darkness, or the darkness that came over the land. You ever been in a dark room before? You ever been in a situation where you couldn't see the hand in front of your face? In uh, August 1st, 1914, August 1st, 1914, the crew of uh, the Endurance, led by Sir Ernest Shackleton, went out on an expedition in order to make it to Antarctica. He was an, uh, an explorer, famous explorer, and his goal was to sail to Antarctica and then hike across it. I've done a lot of hiking trips. That's not one on my bucket list. I'm just saying. But he sets out in 1914, and as they are bound for Antarctica, something terrible happens. The ship they're sailing on gets lodged in ice. They never made it to Antarctica because it became hopelessly lodged in this ice pack. And on January 15th, uh, January of 1915, and from that point, their goal was basically just to survive. I mean, they're on an ice pack. They're frozen in it with this ship. It's not like they could break apart from it, and they are stuck. And this crew faced many hardships, many, as you can imagine. Food supplies started to dwindle. Temperatures got down to, down to uh, dangerously low temperatures. They nearly starved, this crew did. But of all, the fro of all the frozen, all the fears, all the things, all the terrors they faced being stuck on that ice pack, the sailors grew the most uneasy about one thing that was coming that May. And it's something we're starting to experience here. The darkness. <laughs> I was talking with somebody about the idea of living in Alaska and how awesome that would be for six months until it got dark. But you can imagine, being in a ship, they would even be able to look up and see the stars, at least, and the moon. They'd be able to at least see their hand, yet this is something in Shackleton's biographer wrote about this. He said, in all the world, there is no desolation more complete than the polar night. It's a return to the ice age. No warmth, no life, no movement. Only those who have experienced it can fully appreciate what it means to be without the sun day after day, week after week. Few men accustomed to it can fight off its effects altogether, and it has driven some men mad. Well, in Exodus chapter 10, Pharaoh's gonna, he's gonna get hit with a couple plagues. One is the plague of the locusts, the other is this plague of darkness that comes over the land of Egypt. Darkness, the scripture said, is a darkness that can be felt. Ever felt that kind of darkness? 
Several years ago, my, my, my wife and I, my kids, we were going out to Iowa visiting my sister on a vacation. And on the way, we decided to do a little like jot up into Minnesota. We've always want, we always wanted to see where uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder was, lived and all of that. But in one of the little sort of um, offshoots of that trip we found on road trippers was this farm. About 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, the people that owned this farm discovered on this farm this cave. And the cave, they started to probe and explore. They found out there was this massive cave system under just a regular old farm. Like you look around and it is just like anywhere in Hillsdale County. There's this massive cave system under it. And so, like every red-blooded capitalist American, they took advantage of it and turned it into a tourist trap. <laughs> well, we trapped. We, we, we took the bait. We ended up going. And I remember going down. We had to sign this little thing because there ain't no coming out. Like, they can't bring you out of that. You've got to, like, walk out. It's so far in, apparently. Well, they took us down on this tour, and we walked, I think, like a mile. It just feel like a mile. It was a long ways under the ground. We get to this point, and the tour guide says, all right, everybody, I want you to stop. I want you to securely plant your feet and I don't want you to move. And then he shut the lights off. And I have not been in such darkness my entire life. Literally could not see my hand right here in front of my face. It was a darkness I could feel. And it's amazing for how short the lights were off, how much the dread just immediately started to tempt us and kick in. It was like, oh, you hear that gasp? Because literally you can't see nothing. Like, by nothing, I mean nothing, nothing. Not even your hands, six inches, three inches, two inches from the front of your face. This is the kind of darkness Pharaoh encounters in Exodus chapter 10, which is interesting because chief among the gods of the Egyptians was this god Ra, who was the sun god, caused the sun to come up in the day and to set at night. We've been talking about in these plagues how a lot of these plagues were a direct affront to the Egyptians' gods. And here is no exception. We have the sun god Ra being confronted directly by God darkening Egypt. The locusts and the gods associated with their crops being decimated and humiliated by these bugs that are just crawling everywhere. Anybody been in a situation where you've had bugs crawling all over you? Yeah. It's not pleasant. Not pleasant indeed. Several years ago, my, on my 15th wedding anniversary, my wife and I did a, a, a trip up north, doing a bunch of hiking and that sort of thing. One of the things we loved, we did and we loved, is one of the things, most amazing things we'd ever did was we kayaked pictured rocks, which was in, on Lake Superior. And we were with this group, and one of, the t- one of the times we would sort of stop and we'd have lunch, and we stopped on this beach. And my wife and I, we're Michiganders, and we knew that up north on the beaches of Lake Michigan are these things called... Black flies. I don't know if nobody else got the memo, but everybody else in all their skimpy swimsuits and all that stuff, they're on the beach going like this and all this. And my wife and I, we're in our hiking pants, our head nets, and all this just sitting back. But we were swarmed with flies. You can imagine. This would be a devastating thing because these flies didn't bite the Egyptians. They decimated their crops, eating every last bit of wheat, barley, all the things that they were going to rely on for food. This, these are the plagues that Pharaoh is facing because of his stupidity. We're not going to focus so much on that, though. But I would like to invite you to open in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 10. I'll explain in a little bit. I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through 11. And at this time, I would invite you to stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. God's word is authoritative and true, and we stand out of respect when we read it to honor it, honor what God has written. This is the word of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I might perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I'll bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. It will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. 
Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's official said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go, worship the Lord your God, he said, but tell me who will be going. Moses answered, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, the Lord be with you if I let you go, along with your women and children. Clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you've been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his hand, his staff over Egypt. And the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all of Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail. Everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees, nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and and said, I have sinned against the Lord and against your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Father, we have heard your word. Lord, open our hearts, soften our hearts to receive it, and to allow your Holy Spirit to use it to sanctify us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. Hopefully when you came in, you received some notes, pull those out, follow along with me. This is the message I was supposed to preach last Sunday. So I wound up in the hospital with bronchitis. By the way, it wasn't all that, it was that bad. It was just that I can't wait another day to get that thing fixed. I started getting sick on Thursday night. It got worse and worse and worse. I thought to myself, surely it'll be done by Sunday. And no, it wasn't. It just got worse. Um... There's a lot of things we've been covering in this series in Exodus, especially with the plagues and their confrontation of the gods of Egypt and all of that. One of the things that's been very fascinating to me in this, is, and some of the things I haven't really shared with you, is sort of this rabbit hole I've gone down personally and looking at some of the archaeological evidence that points to the fact of the Exodus. There's some very fascinating things if you look at the, at the historical record, the archaeological record, even of things from this time and place, this period, that point to the Exodus and give an interesting perspective on it. And one of the things that I came across in the studies was this thing called the Ipwar Papyrus. It's a picture of it on the next screen, or at least part of it. The Ipwar Papyrus. Um, Not a lot about it. It was discovered, what, about 100 years ago, but it currently resides in the Dutch National Museum. The interesting thing about this papyrus is it's a, it's a, uh, an Egyptian is writing this uh, poem, for lack of better, poem is not like poetry today in, in ancient texts, by the way. But he writes this uh, long poem of all these things that are happening, and it's basically this outline of all these cataclysms that are happening in Egypt at the time of the Exodus, or around the time of the Exodus. Talks about this chaos, this chaotic world where societal roles have been reversed. Interestingly enough, parts of it talk about how poor men have become owners of wealth, how slaves have become rich, just like the Exodus accounts. Hearts turning to violence, distress, pestilence. And in fact, in one part, the translator of this translates this uh, saying where he says, Indeed, the river is blood, yet men drink of it. Men shrink from human beings and thirst after water. These pestilence, it talks about indeed gold and lapis lazuli, silver and turquoise, carnelian and amethyst, you know, all these Fancy stones are strung on the necks of maidservants and slaves. Interesting in light of what the Exodus shares about the, the slaves plundering there, the Hebrews plundering the Egyptians, being sent off, the trees being felled and branches stripped off because of these pestilences. I don't know about you, it fascinates me. 
when I look at uh, some of the secular um, well, that's historic archaeological things and how they line up with what the Bible teaches. But I don't want to focus too much on that today. For our sake, what I want to do is I want to focus on what, what, what sort of extra facets do we need to be paying attention to as we look at a chapter like Exodus, chapter 10. And so as I was studying this text, this question kept coming up into my mind, this idea of this is a question for the day. As the story of Exodus continues to fold, what, what further insights about God do we discover? Do we encounter? We've talked about the gods that are under judgment. We've talked about Pharaoh. We've talked about Moses. But there's three things in particular that as I read this text brought some nuance of understanding. And so, as the story of Exodus continues to unfold, what further insights about God do we encounter? The first one, I believe, is this that we see in the text. God's regard for the generations to come. If you look at verse 1 and 2, you're going to see a theme in here that's repeated throughout the scriptures, but that's this one. The Lord says to Moses, go, for I've hardened Pharaoh's heart, the hearts of his officials, that I may perform these miraculous signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. We've seen earlier how one of the purposes of the Exodus was worship. But it wasn't just worship. One of the purposes of the Exodus we talked about and explored last week was making God's name famous. But it wasn't just so that that could be made famous. God did all of these wondrous things so that after having brought his people out of Egypt, they may instill these things in the next generation, in the generations to come. Why? Because, quite frankly, God cares about kids. <laughs> God cares about people. We've already learned how these are mirror, these incredible things God is doing. And God wanted future generations to have something incredible to be identified with. Indeed, to this day, the Israelites, the Hebrews, are, the Jews are identified very, very deeply with this account. Every year we celebrate the Passover, where the Jews re, actually relive the story of the Exodus through the Seder meal. We've done that here in this church several times. I, I, while we can only speculate as to what's going on in the mind of God, though, there, there's a few things that kind of make me think that this is why this is important. Why was it important for the Jews to pass these stories on to their kids? Well, first of all, God didn't want his people to end up in slavery again. They didn't, you remember the, the, the Hebrews were experiencing this incredibly cruel treatment. Bricks without straw, no breaks. It's incredible slavery. They were the incredible oppression. And that kicks off the whole story, doesn't it? God looks down. He sees the oppression of his people, and he's concerned about them. God didn't want his people to face that kind of cruel treatment. God wanted, and wanted his people to know that he alone was God. There's no one else like him. He was God, and he demonstrated that time and time again by humiliating, systematically humiliating the Egyptian gods, as we've been seeing and will continue to see. I think one of the big things that God wants to do, though, is he wants his people to have a perpetual sense of holy fear instilled in them. That he is a God who judges sin, and he is a God who will bend the elements of nature to deliver his people to safety. And these stories would be a powerful, or were to be a powerful reminder to subsequent generations that this was the God that they served is why it is so, so important even now for us to be concerned about this, that we continue to tell the story of the Exodus, that we continue to tell the story of God in the Bible, especially in the story of the gospel and what Jesus came to accomplish. Stories have a powerful way of, of helping you remember to do things. Last uh, Friday, before I got super sick, I was in a uh, deer blind. Anybody else in a deer blind last Friday? few of us? Okay. It's in a deer blind Friday, sitting there, waiting on opening day for my 30 point buck to walk in front of me at the Sodi deer camp. I'm just Sorry, got to no, no movies, I guess. 
Um, and I was thinking back to when I was in hunter safety. And I remember in hunter safety, they told us several stories of people who, hunters who were not really safe or careful with their guns. Why did they tell us these stories and show us the news clippings? Because they wanted to instill in us the fact that these are not toys to be played with. And if you treat them trifly or not treat them with the proper respect and honor that they deserve, things can go terribly bad. So I was thinking about that as I was in my deer blind, going through my list, making sure my safety's on. As I go out, make sure my gun's pointed down as I'm walking in the field, you know, making sure I've got my hunter's orange on and all of this stuff. All of these little safety things. Why? Because story after story reinforced in me. If you don't do that, you're probably going to end up, yeah, shot. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Josiah. Yeah. Those stories are told to ensure our safety as hunters, to ensure how just how vitally important it is to respect the tool that we are carrying in our hands, how guns are not to be played with or trifled with or treated cavalierly because failing to take them seriously leads to serious consequences, just like God. Pharaoh treating God cavalierly, not giving him the proper respect and honor that he deserves, refusing to relent. And so God brings plague after plague to judge him, but also to give, his, give their people these stories to tell so that they would, take, they would know that this God is a God who is powerful not to be messed with. That's the first one. The second thing is this, the long-suffering nature of God, I think this text brings out. At least in the sense that up until this point, Pharaoh's had plenty of chances. I mean, come on, Pharaoh. If you look at the plagues, he doesn't start off with the death of the firstborn, which we'll cover at the, we'll cover later. We're taking a break next week to do Advent. That's going to be awesome, Advent season. Um, but this plagues, these plagues highlight this idea that God is a long-suffering God. Now, God isn't long-suffering in the sense that he gets upset and he, he cries in a corner. <laughs> that's not the kind of long-suffering that, I'm, that's not long-suffering when we read about it in the Bible. What long-suffering means here is this idea that you know, God is, puts up with a lot. And in fact, in this text, or in, in the pages of the, the account of the plagues, you see God doesn't go straight to the death of the firstborn. No, he starts with, all right, stabs, swallowing other stabs, snakes, you know. Then the rivers turn to blood. Everything, there's a progression of that. The frogs, then the flies, and gnats, and boil. There's a progression to everything. Because God is long-suffering. He'll put up with stuff for a time. And try to get someone's attention, like Pharaoh's, but eventually the hammer's coming down. But he doesn't look forward to doing that, which I think should indicate to us the profound grace of God. He doesn't look forward to judging sin. The fact that he has to do it while necessary in light of his holiness, his holy nature, isn't something he takes pleasure in. We see him in this, again, we see time and time again, Pharaoh's given this opportunity to relent. Now, he doesn't take it, but God gives it to him. We see in other parts of Scripture how God gives people opportunity to relent even after them having done so much to deserve only his wrath. Yet God, in his grace, suffers long. He's patient. He, he, he tolerates to a certain extent the violation of people against his holy nature and holy care. But eventually the hammer comes down. We don't know when that is. But in Pharaoh's case, he wasn't getting the thing. And I think this text brings us up. It's a long-suffering God that is the God of the Hebrews. Boy, this text, the whole book begins with this sort of incredible violation on Pharaoh's part. The slavery of the Egyptians, the killing of the babies. And while some of us would immediately exact judgment on someone like that, God doesn't. He tries to get his attention. He tries to get his attention. He tries to get his attention. And while God could have judged Pharaoh in such a way so as to affect the people right away, in other words, he could have just caused an earthquake to split the Nile and the land of Goshen from each other and whatever. There's a progression to it because God is, I believe, long, I know, is long-suffering. 
He doesn't give what people deserve. He doesn't give us what we deserve right away. But he's kind to us. He's gracious to us. He reaches out to us and says, come, come. Now, in the case of Pharaoh, there came a point when mm, he's done. All in God's sovereign timing and all of that. But again, this text brings out this idea that God is long-suffering. And that's a good thing for you and me. For mankind. Because God doesn't give us as our sins deserve. And because of Christ, we can actually have our the record of our sin expunged entirely. That's the second thing. The third thing I think that really comes out and I want to focus on here is this idea of the, the totality of God's claim on his people. I don't know if you saw this. Young and old, sons and daughters, flocks and herds. Now, we didn't read this portion of the text this morning. I'll, let's jump around a little bit just to kind of bring this out. It says in verse 3, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go if you refuse. I'll bring locusts and all of that. So there's that petition to Pharaoh to let the people go. Later on, Moses answers, we will go with our young and old sons and daughters, with our flocks and herds. So it's everybody's going to go celebrate this festival. And then we get to verse 24. And Pharaoh summons Moses and says, go worship the Lord. Right? He's, get out of here. Go do this thing. Go. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. And Moses says, you must allow us to have sacrifices and on and on and on. Young and old, sons and daughters, flocks and herds. And we saw these early portions. One of this, this idea behind Exodus was worship. And the, the, the Israelites being called out of Egypt to be a people of worship. And what's interesting that happens here is Pharaoh's response to Moses is essentially this. First of all, just go with the boys. You take the men, leave the women and children. Moses is like, no, I, I can't do that. All right, fine. Fine, fine. Take your, take your women and children. Just leave your flocks and herds. And Moses is like, no, I can't do that either. Notice that wasn't okay. What's interesting to me is that they had to take their flocks and herds as well. And I think there's something to this. They were taking with them their means of income and sustenance. They were taking with them the things, some of which they would have to sacrifice, other of which would continue to be their means of income and sustenance. Because this can be, and I believe this communicates this idea to us, this important principle when it comes to worship. And that worship, that is this, that worship isn't just what we do with our minds and bodies, but worship is what happens when we offer to God what is already God's at His disposal. When worship is a totality thing. It's not just a, uh, you know, this, I, I worship on Sundays, and I worship by um, or I worship by serving in some way, shape, or form. No, there's a wholeness to their life, the whole of their lives. And we're kind of told that a little bit in Romans, aren't we? That we are to be living acts of worship. There's a totality of God's claim on his people, not just the men, not just the women, not just the men, women, and children, but even their flocks and herds. They were God's people. There was a totality of claim God had on his people. Because God makes it clear, worship is not a segmented or selective act. It involves the whole person. Our time, our talents, our resources, we as a community. There's a totality of claim God had on his people, not just the men. Now, in that society, women and children didn't mean much which I think is telling for us. In that time and age, where women didn't mean much of anything, God says, no, I want your men, women, and children, and your flocks and herds. I want the whole of your being, the whole of your community, your economy even, to be offered, to be available for worship. God's ask, his ask, is all-encompassing of their lives, of their people. So those are, three, those are some new facets I'm looking at in the plagues and seeing, oh, this is interesting, like these new facets that are coming out in light of the plagues. I want to challenge us 
um, to look at this text a couple of reflective ways back to us in conclusion. Just two things. You guys ask, how does this passage reflect back at us as Jesus' disciples? Well, I think the first thing that really compelled me in light of looking at this chapter was to catch a vision for living beyond our generation. That's the first thing. These acts were done in Egypt, says in verse 2, so that you may tell your children and grandchildren. I think this is a very important thing for us. And one of the, one of the things I loved about, love about our church is that we have a very historic, um, I can't even English today. It's been a couple weeks. We have a historic love for children in our community. We need to keep doing that. Young lives, young lives. We need to keep that up. Because these stories are important to pass on to the next generation. It may even be something we need to double down on. If you've looked around at subsequent generations, generations that's coming up, telling the good news, telling these stories of God and His work in humankind to the generations, to our children and our grandchildren, and to some great of us have great grandchildren. But not just that, even as a faith community, this is important for us to do, to make the effort to talk to our kids, our young ones about the goodness of God, the goodness of Him in Jesus Christ, and what God has done for us and the mighty acts He went through to accomplish that. That's the first thing. <sighs> Deuteronomy 6, Moses writes this and gives this commandment. These commandments, he's talking to the people of Israel. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I believe one of the things that is incumbent on us and Christians is to love on and invest in the next generation, to tell them of the good news and the goodness of God so that they too can fear and love the Lord. Second thing is this, is that it challenges our own proclivity to hold back what is rightfully God's. To the people of Israel, God's claim on them was everything, person but also resources making those things available for worship as they were about to do in going out into the world. And as Augustine is attributed to have saying, Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. And there's this idea that are we, if we look at our lives, what are we holding back that is rightfully God's in regards to the holistic life that we live? And think about that. My gospel connection is this today, this morning. The gospel presents all people with a choice. This is kind of jumping a bit to more metaphor, but remain in Egypt or experience Goshen. Remain in darkness or enjoy freedom in the light. Something else we see oftentimes in Scripture is this allusion back to Egypt as this sort of, this sort of place and symbolic of the sin and death and um, slavery and suffering. And this idea that we don't want to go back to Egypt because it sucks. It was awful. You should not want to go back to Egypt. And in this text specifically, although we didn't read it today, this idea, this contrast between darkness and light reminds me, at least, of what Jesus said in John chapter 3 when he says this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. And will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And later on in John 12, Jesus says this about himself. I have come into the world as a light. That no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And then here... In even the pages of Exodus, we catch a glimpse of the purpose of the gospel. To take, and if you read the text, you'll notice it was dark in Egypt, but it wasn't dark in Goshen. They had the light they needed. And there's this idea of contrast that's set out for us in the pages of Scripture. Whereas this land of Egypt, representing the land of sin and death, is contrasted with the land of Goshen where the people of God live and enjoy the light that is from God. And it holds out to us this ask, if you will. Do you want to live in darkness? 
Do you want to be living? Do you want to live in light? And what the Apostle Paul says about this when we turn our hearts to Jesus is this, is that for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Again in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Does that sound familiar? That's what the people of God, that's what the Israelites were supposed to be. But he's not talking about the people of Israel. It's a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Isn't that crazy? And then in 1 John, I love the contrast he gives here. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Are you in the kingdom of darkness? Are you feeling that? You don't have to live there. You could be transferred to another kingdom, the kingdom of light kingdom that Christ came to establish. And all it takes for you to turn and go there is to turn and look to Jesus, the light of the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are, you are the light of the world. There is no darkness. Lord, it's, it's interesting to me how even in the, the, the account of the Exodus, that story that we, that we read, we see the goodness of the gospel. Lord, Egypt was enveloped with darkness, this darkness that could be felt. This darkness that can really be interpreted as, this, as, as the world in sin. And yet Goshen, where your people lived, had plenty of light. Lord, just again, seeing this idea that you, you, your people are a people of light because of the light that you are. Lord, we've seen a lot of things in these plagues, but Lord, I, I pray... Um, Maybe today, if there is someone here that is, they're, they're walking in the land of darkness. They're walking in Egypt. Lord, that the goodness of your son would be so prevalent, that it's so apparent that they would turn and turn to him, be transferred from that kingdom of darkness into light this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, may your Holy Spirit uh, help us to understand it. And more importantly, help us to live it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.